When you look up into space, do you think Long Island? Well, you should, because a lot of the equipment and spacecrafts that's gone up to the sky has been built right here in Long Island. Hi, I'm Carleen Lavelle, and this is Did You Know? A segment on LIE Magazine where I tell you something you probably didn't know about Long Island. On this episode, we visit the Cradle of Aviation to learn more about space, aviation, and Long Island. Today, we're meeting with Andrew Parton. He's the executive director of the Cradle of Aviation, and he's gonna tell us more about Long Island and space exploration on the moon. That's right, on the moon, so come on. <laughs> Hi, Andrew. Hi. Thank you so much for having me. Well, thanks for coming. So, we're on the moon. We're on the moon. But before we talk about the moon, I have lots of questions for you. Well, hopefully I've got lots of answers. I think you do, from what I hear. <laughs> First of all, how did it get its name? Well, uh, it goes back to uh, around 1910, mm -hmm. uh, when after the Wright brothers took off in 1903, a lot of um, aviators, descended on Long Island. A mm -hmm. lot of it was, it was, the, the land was flat. It was mm -hmm. always windy here. And we we're also close to New York City. Mm -hmm. And being close to New York City, there were a lot of uh, competitions and contests being created to be the first to do something. Mm -hmm. And aviation was the new frontier. Right. So uh, a lot of early feats of daredevils and early feats of uh, being the first to do stuff occurred right here on Long Island. Mm -hmm. So while we don't call ourselves the birthplace of Long Island, of aviation, because that would be Kitty Hawk, mm -hmm. where the Wright brothers took off, right. we became the cradle. It's where we like to say aviation grew up. And this physical location where the museum sits, is there any significance with it? Well, we're physically on what was called the Hempstead Plains. Uh, so okay. it was very flat ground. Mm -hmm. And as I said, this is where a lot of those early aviators migrated. Uh, to try to be the first and the best. And being close to New York City, that's where the prize money was. Because mm -hmm. everything was about prize money. Okay. So to be the first, you were going to be able to get $50,000, which in 1910 was a hell of a lot of money. Okay. So you said aviation grew up here. How did it establish itself as an industry? Well, you had, uh, as I said, uh, the famous pilots were here. Right. And that brought famous mechanics and engineers. Okay. Okay. And from there, industry grew up because mm -hmm. they saw that uh, a aviation was a growing business and a growing opportunity. So you had somebody like Leroy Grumman started wow. his business in 1929 in a garage in Baldwin. Uh, and then you had others like Glenn Curtis, who was the first person to fly a plane on Long Island. Mm -hmm. uh, he started his own uh, aviation or airplane company uh, back around 1912. Uh, so, and again, that just tended to bring more and more people here. So walk me through it. How did we get from this evolution of aviation with, you know, airplanes to space? I mean, that's a big leap, at least in my mind. Well, I mean, when you think about it, which a lot of people, uh, until you point it out, right. in 1903, the Wright brothers were the first to fly a powered aircraft. Yes. All right. Only 66 years later, we landed on the moon, mm. which is not a lot of time. No. Um, but what you had with uh, a lot of great engineers and innovators, uh, you had companies like a Grumman in particular that um, was very big with the military in building aircraft to support the war mm -hmm. effort. So in the late 50s, mid to late 50s, when the effort was uh, steered during the Cold War to the space program, a lot of companies like Grumman uh, would submit proposals to the military, the Air Force, or the, the federal government to get into the game of building spacecraft. Because if you're building airplanes and you've conquered the uh, theories of flight, mm -hmm. uh, then it's conquering the next challenge is conquering space. And so a lot of that same technology and a lot of those same engineers who worked on aircraft were starting to work on spacecraft. With aircrafts and space being developed in Long Island, did we make any significant contributions to space exploration? 
Well, I, I think uh, the biggest is that uh, at Grumman uh, mm -hmm. on Long Island, we built the lunar modules that, that landed uh, six crews onto the moon, surface okay. of the moon. It's the only time it's ever happened. Um, it's probably one of the most significant engineering achievements in, in world history, not just U.S. history, uh, to be able to take uh, two men and land them on the moon and then bring them back safely. Uh, was was huge considering they weren't working with um, computers they were working with slide rules to do the computations um, so what a lot of people lose sight of is all of the advances that came out of the space program uh, if you think back to the 60s mm -hmm. computers were as big as this room <laughs> um, that's a big room <laughs> and what had to happen was you had to start miniaturizing a lot of that stuff so making computers so they're more portable, they're more compatible for things like going into space were driven by the space program. If you look at uh, cellular technology, the okay. ability to communicate over you know, thousands and thousands of miles and millions of miles, that all came out of the space program. If you even look at renewable energy, uh, solar panels, uh, which now power the space station, mm -hmm. those came out of the, spa out of the uh, space program. And those are the same solar panels you use on your roof at, your, at home. Uh, if you look at wind turbines, it's a propeller. So it all came out of aviation. Um, a lot of people just think that the space program gave you Tang, which is the orange <laughs> drink, uh, or Velcro. Right. Uh, but it did a hell of a lot more than that to uh, sort of advance technology uh, across a number of fields. To see part two of my interview at the Cradle of Aviation, tune in to the next episode of Did You Know? The Cradle of Aviation is unique because it has a prized possession, which is the lunar module, right? and only one of three in the world. The, the program was going to go up to Apollo 20. Mm -hmm. uh, the last mission was Apollo 17, and then the funding for the program was cut uh, by the federal government. So the last uh, mission to the moon was Apollo 17, so Apollo 18, 19, and 20. Those lunar modules that were all built here on Long Island still exist. One's at the Kennedy Space Center, one's at the Smithsonian in Washington, and we are lucky enough to have the third. Ours would have been Apollo 18. And unlike the other two institutions, your module sits on the moon. We wanted to give people the feeling of what it was like when the Armstrong took his first steps on the moon. So we display it on a lunar environment. Uh, it is the only one displayed that way. Uh, we've had Apollo 11 astronaut Buzz Aldrin here a number of times, and he's always said this is his favorite lunar module. Okay. All right. So as far as acquiring uh, space ships and lunar modules and aircraft, the biggest thing for me is how do you do that? How does that come about? I mean, rumor has it eBay can help with that. <laughs> but how does one get a plane in their house. The lunar module came to us from the Grumman Corporation, which is now Northrop Grumman. Uh, this was sitting in, in boxes in a warehouse and was brought here as a donation. And uh, our docents, our volunteers in the galleries, uh, rebuilt it uh, the way it would have looked on the moon. And these docents weren't just like general volunteers, they actually worked at the... Many of them who work in the space gallery were working on the Apollo space program at Grumman. So if, you, if you're able to get one of them while you're walking around the museum, you're going to get a little piece of history too. And 2018 marks a significant year for the lunar module, is that 2019, right? 2019. 2019 marks a significant year. And what is that? That will be the 50th anniversary of Neil Armstrong taking the first steps on the moon. It will be July 20th, uh, 1969. So in July 20th of 1919, uh, <laughs> will be the 50th anniversary. And is the museum doing anything to commemorate that or in preparation we are, for it? We are going to start uh, what we're calling our Countdown to Apollo at 50. And that will be a series of events and activities, a new exhibit here at the museum. Uh, and what we want to do is celebrate all the achievements of Apollo but also look to the future of space exploration. You know, should we go back to the moon? Should we go on to Mars? How are we going to do that? And what we're hoping is that 
all of the events and activities both here at the museum and with school districts that we're working with will help to inspire a new group of kids to say, I want to go into that business. I want to be an engineer. I want to be an astronaut. Uh, and so that's what we're hoping, is that a few light bulbs go off of kids on Long Island or from Brooklyn or Queens that say, that's what I want to do. And one of the real interesting things from what I've seen, just the bits of walking around, and I hope to do some more today, is you have a lot of partnerships with science, technology, education partners. Can you tell me more about that? And is it primarily for students? Is it for adults? Is it for people like me? <laughs> It's, it's kind of for everybody. I mean, we like to say that whether you're two or 102, um, you can enjoy your visit to the museum. Um, we have partnerships with a lot of colleges and universities. Uh, we have partnerships with probably uh, the majority of school districts in the area uh, who use this as kind of a teaching uh, lesson. So uh, school groups that come here, it isn't just a free-for-all, they'll have a programmed uh, uh, lesson plan that they have here or they can go into our theater in the Dome Theater and see a, a magnificent show. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a lot for everybody. Um, even little kids, two or three year olds, are amazed by the colors and the shapes and sizes and you know they know about Buzz Lightyear uh, <laughs> so we try to tell them about Buzz Aldrin. So. <laughs> um, and then just the average visitor, it's, uh, it tells a story. It tells a history of this, this region. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the connections that aviation and the role aviation played in that history. So what is the mission of the museum? We actually have three missions. Okay. All right. Our three missions are preservation, mm -hmm. education, and inspiration. Okay. So preservation is obviously preserving our rich history. Mm -hmm. um, education is using that collection of aircraft and spacecraft we have to educate students about science, technology, engineering, and math and then using all of that to inspire them for careers in aviation or aerospace. So, and they all work together. So events that we hold, programs we run, all try to fit those three missions. Well, this is all like, amazing to hear about, but I want to check it out. So what, how do I start? What do I do? Well, I think what you should do is take some time and go through the galleries chronologically. Okay. Uh, and then you can come back to me and tell you what you like the best. I think I can do that. Great. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. To explore the Cradle of Aviation Museum with me, tune in to the next episode of Did You Know? If you ever want to learn how an actual spaceship is built, come to the Cradle of Aviation where you can check out a white room. The white room does a lot more than what it sounds like. A white room is a place where the engineers and the astronauts come together to assemble the aircraft in its entirety. This room is stripped of all dirt, trash, and foreign objects that are not useful to the completion of a project. Also, to ensure the best possible environment for innovation and development, temperature, humidity, and pressure are controlled. And everyone who works in a white room wears a clean suit. It typically resembles overalls and is worn to prevent the contamination of equipment and gear. If you want a ticket to space and you want to use that ticket and board, the best place to do that is at the Cradle of Aviation's Planetarium and Digital Theater. It has one of the highest and best resolutions and will take you to space and beyond. The Cradle of Aviation is home to eight exhibits which commemorate Long Island's contribution to flight and space. Walking around, you can see some of the earliest aircrafts, like gliders and hot air balloons, hanging from the ceiling. Exhibits run in chronological order, starting with the Hempstead Plains, which is a life-size replica of what Long Island looked like in the early 1900s. The exhibit features a replica of a Herring Curtis No. 1 Golden Flyer from 1909, which was built by well-known aviator Glenn Curtis. Another real-life treasure of this exhibit is this plane called a Blario, which is one of the oldest planes in the world. And that woman standing by the Blario? That's Harriet Quimby. She was the first woman to gain a pilot license in the United States 
and the first woman to fly across the English Channel. Next up, I visit the World War I gallery, which displays the assembly of a plane from the 1900s. The Cradle of Aviation Museum has over 75 air and spacecrafts, a dozen cockpits, and over 30 hands-on exhibits, which also include these cool displays. What's great about the museum is that you do not have to be an astronaut if you want to see or fly a spaceship. You just have to be curious. There is so much to see here that I don't even think I can get it done in one visit. So next time you'll have to join me. But I want you to remember that if you ever think about going to space, head to Long Island. I'm Carleen LaBelle and this is Did You Know? Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye. If you have any comments, cool facts, or suggestions for our next Did You Know segment, send us a note at info at patv.org.